Let us celebrate the loving presence of God in our lives, finding in each other as we worship evidence of faith, trust, and love, of witness, worship, and service in God's name. Let us pray. We pray to you, O Father of us all, knowing that you can transform our lives from the ordinary into the extraordinary. Set our eyes, our ears, and our spirit toward you, so that we may better understand you and your will, and make us bearers of the good news as imparted through your spirit. All this we pray in the name of the one who taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. A reading of Psalm number 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, this I seek, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent, he will set me high on a rock. Now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud, be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off, do not forsake me, 
O God of my salvation, if my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witness has risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. During our time of silent prayer, let us remember George O.B. O'Brien, Brad Martin, Heather and Ed Stevenson, Sona Wyman, Alan Dorn, Penny Putnam, Bill Young, Cody Pound, Perry Green, Finn Daly, Kayla Daly, Brooke Daly, Daniela and Matteo Siriello and their parents, and all medical staff devoting their lives to helping children, all prisoners of war, all service women and servicemen, all those afflicted with and by the virus, all innocents caught up in violence and unrest, all God's creatures, both great and small. Let us pray. Creator God of all that is and who reveals your majesty and glory through your Son, confirm us, we pray, as your children. Bring us to a more perfect knowledge of your will and of your love for us, making us joyful in your service and rendering us fruitful in our tasks. We are thankful for the talents with which you have graced us in our lives and rejoice that we are able to make use of them in service to one another as we seek the common good. We are grateful for the joys which you offer to us in our love for one another in hopes of a better future for us all. We are humbled, O God, by the care you show us daily, having confidence in your abiding compassion and mercy. Lord God, as your children, we would not shrink from the guidance of your spirit, nor from your loving reproof when we are tempted to wander from your ways. Show us in and through your word the path in which we should walk. Bid us to follow your Son ever more attentively, for his truth is a light to our feet. Make clear your intentions for each one of us as we join together in dedicated witness and labor as a community of faith so that our efforts for Christ might be fully blessed. Increase in us, O Heavenly Father, our devotion to your kingdom of love and light that in the coming weeks and years we might find ever heartening signs of its inevitable approach. May your rule in our lives increase without fail, giving greater hope for a world in which the Prince of Peace holds full sway, governing in meekness as our advocate and our champion. May our submission to him demonstrate our devotion to his cause as our allegiance to him shows our fidelity and our loyalty. Bestow upon us, O Lord, the grace and the will to persevere in adherence to Christ's teachings, that we might exemplify what it means to live abundantly. Accept our prayers which we offer for our church, our community, our nation, and for this world. Remind us, as inhabitants of the most prosperous country on earth, that to whom much has been given, much will be required. All this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Our scripture lesson is taken from the second chapter of Paul's letter to the Philippians. We're going to start at verse 12 and read through verse 18. Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring and arguing, so that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. It is by your holding fast to the word of life that I can boast on the day of Christ that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out as a libation over the sacrifice and the offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. And in the same way, you must also be glad and rejoice with me. Here end the morning scripture lessons. This morning, I'm presenting something of an advertisement for upcoming sessions of our midweek Bible studies, beginning January 26. The entire series, as you remember, is entitled Major Themes of Scripture. Our next theme, theme number seven, to be exact, is about sin and its consequences. And to talk about sin, I'd like to let you eavesdrop on a conversation I had over 30 years ago with a new colleague, a theologian whom I came to admire very much. He was someone many of you, or maybe even all of you, have never even heard of. Wilfred Cantwell Smith, who died in 2000, 
was a professor of comparative religion at Harvard. And it was my privilege to sit next to him quite by accident at a conference held at Hartford Seminary in 1990. I had already heard of Professor Smith since he had authored a book on Islam, which I inadvertently, when I inadvertently sat down next to him. But I really didn't have much of an idea as to what he was actually famous for. So I don't even remember what the question was that I asked him, but I will always remember the answer he gave to my forgotten query. He said this, religions are at odds with each other, not because they give different answers to the same questions. Religions differ because they don't even ask the same questions in the first place. Although I wasn't fully aware of what Professor Smith was trying to say, I intuited that he was onto something that I had never really even thought about. For example, Islam differs from Christianity for a variety of reasons, but at base they differ because Christianity talks about, among other things, original sin, which results from the disobedience of Adam and Eve, while Islam does not even see humanity as fallen. In Islam, there is no original sin. In fact, Judaism knows nothing of original sin either, nor does just about any other religion we can think about. Christianity asks about the fall of humanity due to original sin. But no one else even asks that question. That is a typically Christian question. My question is, why is this important? Because this morning I'm not here to speak to the question of original sin or the fall of humanity in the Garden of Eden. What is important about this question is, what do we, from a Christian point of view, think that we have to do to overcome our separation from God and our need to be reconciled to God. These are questions that virtually no other faith systems worry about, even though virtually all religions recognize that there is a real separation, a real gap between humankind on the one hand from God on the other hand. And how that gap is bridged is another occasion for differences among religions. In any case, the remedies for sinfulness, which, for example, the Apostle Paul comes up with, are quite foreign to Muslims and Jews, who, like Christians, see us all as having to become reconciled to our common creator. Of those three religions, only Christianity sees the need for a savior. So a crucifixion, for example, is seen differently outside of Christianity. In fact, Islam denies that Jesus was even crucified. To Muslims, there is no need for a crucifixion. Besides, in Islam, God would never allow a person of Christ's status and importance to be put to death. Now, from within Christianity, the, the Apostle Paul doesn't have the time to address all the solutions to the problems of sinfulness which require a savior. In Philippians alone, Paul cites these imperfections in humankind. There's vanity, conceit, stubbornness, infighting, conscientiousness, pride, self-centeredness, resentment, crookedness, materialism, dishonesty, injustice, and so much more. And the solutions to successfully dealing with such evils are as varied as the shortcomings themselves. But the solution to conceit, for example, is a different one than the solution to materialism. Salvation will look very different to a converted deceiver than it will to one who has been saved from his own hedonism. 
Complicating matters is the realization that it's not as if any one of us has only one fault to deal with at a time. Have any of you read The Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis? Screw Tape, an agent of his satanic majesty, writes to a young devil who is earning his first pitchfork. Screw Tape is an upper echelon devil of no mean reputation. He advises his young charge of the many different ways to entice his targeted human being into the paths of evil. After all, there are more than just the seven deadly sins, and even those deadly sins offer seven times seven possibilities for tripping up the unsuspecting human. Screwtape's letter about gluttony was especially delicious, but just as there are many ways of turning from God, there are just as many ways of finding our way back, although turning back isn't a simple matter. From the steps on that path are not the same for everyone. They lead to the same place and result from the same motivating ideal and are directed by the same spirit who points to the same savior. But no one can walk that path for us. No one can save us if we don't wish to be saved. No one can work out for us our own salvation, to borrow a phrase from Paul's letter to the Philippians. We each have our own responsibilities. We each have our own paths to fulfillment. And what's good for you isn't always what's good for me. Just as you can lead a horse to water but cannot make him drink, so God provides the water, provides the guidance to it, even provides the thirst. But we are to work out our own salvation in fear and trembling, knowing that God is at work in us, reconciling the world to himself. May the Savior provide us with the grace necessary for our own salvation. And in the meantime, I look forward to seeing you in Bible study. Amen. May the love of God the Father, the grace of God the Son, and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us and in our homes and with our loved ones now and forevermore. Amen. Mm -hmm.